The next big thing that we're all going to have to face, providing we don't get wiped out, is the fact that we are creating what I and many people believe will be an alternative life form. Again and welcome. Uh, it's so lovely to be back in Edinburgh in front of a live audience again. Um, I'm author and journalist Stephanie Merritt and it's, it's really wonderful to see people in the flesh and also uh, to have our online audience watching from home. Um, the book festival is coming to you from uh, its new home in the Edinburgh College of Art which is part of a long-term partnership with the University of Edinburgh. And our online uh, events this year are pay what you can. So um, if you are able, if you're enjoying this at home and if you've enjoyed many of the other events that are also available online, please do um, go to the link on the website and make a donation so that the festival can continue its wonderful work of bringing stories alive as you've just seen in that film. Um, so thank you very much for joining us uh, wherever you are and now to our author. Um, it's a great privilege to be here talking today to Jeanette Winterson. Uh, in a writing career spanning nearly four decades, she has become oh. one of our most highly regarded and innovative and well-loved writers. Her novels defy genre categories. They've been autobiographical, historical, futuristic, dystopian, horror, fantastical, sometimes all at once. <laughs> She's written children's books, TV dramas, stage plays, essays, short stories, polemics, and journalism, as well as her memoir, Why Be Happy When You Can Be Normal, which I still think is a contender for the best book title of the last 50 years. Um, she has won, among many other awards, the Costa First Novel Award, the John Llewellyn Rees Prize, the E.M. Forster Award, as well as a Best Drama BAFTA. She's an OBE and a CBE, and she's currently Professor of Creative Writing at the University of Manchester. And we are here to talk today about her new book of essays, 12 Bytes, uh, which takes us into her ongoing fascination with technology, and here particularly the world of artificial intelligence. Um, so, Jeanette, it won't come as any surprise to your readers to learn that you are fascinated by machine intelligence, by technology, and all its ramifications, because your, your fiction's reflected that for quite a long time now. But can you tell us about the, the genesis of these essays and what prompted you to start writing nonfiction about this tech world? Ignorance. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a very curious person. I don't like not knowing things, you know? And I realize that along with climate breakdown, which is, is the, the problem facing us most acutely, on our planet. Um, the next big thing that we're all going to have to face, providing we don't get wiped out, is the fact that we are creating what I and many people believe will be an alternative life form. At present, all AI, artificial intelligence, is a tool, as you know. And we use it because humans are tool using animals. Um, that's interesting, it has consequences. Um, you know, Caroline Corrado Perez in her amazing book, which if you haven't read it, Invisible Women, it's all about um, one of the problems with data sets, which of course algorithms are trained on, but the data sets themselves are very narrow and biased. So we've got a situation now with AI where as a tool, it looks like it's objective. Uh, neutral because machines have to be objective and neutral, don't they? They don't. They can't possibly have biases, but of course they are because a machine only has a data set to go on, and if the data set is biased, the machine will then amplify that bias. Which is why we see, um, you know, there was the scandal, wasn't there, with Amazon who were trying to hire some people. They wanted a diverse workforce, and all they were hiring were, were white guys. And somebody thought, what is going on? And then they looked, and the poor the machines that were doing the initial sifting had been trained on data sets, CVs of white guys. So that's who they were picking, so it wasn't neutral at all. So I was interested in that, and I was thinking, well, okay, what if that moves, though? What if it does move from simply being a tool situation uh, into a situation where we are creating a self-reflective, self-determined, self-directed intelligence, an alternative intelligence, not bound to a body, not made of meat like we are, 
um, that won't die, that doesn't need to eat or drink, that doesn't function in any sense, shape or form like Homo sapiens, what happens then? And I thought, I have no fucking idea. And that's why I started thinking, come on, Jeanette, deal with your ignorance. And out of that came these essays. It's, um, I think particularly, what, one of the things that I most enjoyed about this book is that I, um, I think like many people who sort of spend most of their time in the arts and the humanities find this all quite terrifying. The, the idea of mm. this future, it feels so kind of sci-fi and, and actually quite alarming, this, the idea that we will create these um, super intelligences that, that might decide that humans are actually um, not particularly useful or productive. Um, <laughs> We're not, are we? But you're, <laughs> you're, um, you're quite an optimist. That that's what yeah. comes through in the book, is that you've got uh, actually quite an optimistic view of what this um, AI future might offer us. I'm optimistic, perhaps foolishly, because I am. my nature is optimistic. You know, if you've been brought up with Mrs. Winterson, then your only way out was to, was to manage some personal optimism that there was a different life, a better life, and you could escape. So I've carried that with me. So don't depend on my optimism. It might be misplaced. But, you know, it's with humans... It's either, it could be dystopia or it could be utopia. At present, we've, we, know, we are, I feel that we're on a, a sort of brinkmanship moment, aren't we, both with the climate, so many things. We might be pushing ourselves forward, uh, away from our nasty ape-like, chimp-like selves, or all we want to do is land grab and, and cause scarcity. Into, some, into a different kind of world where there could be equality, there could be abundance, we could solve our climate issues, we could have a sharing society, something that's fairer. And, you know, with the book, what I wanted to do, because, as you know, it's divided into four elements, um, the first bit is really, well, how did we get here? And it looks at the Industrial Revolution uh, as a template for the next revolution, which will be the AI revolution, we know that we're just beginning. And it looks back and says, OK, that's the moment, only 250 years ago, when life on planet Earth changed decisively and forever. You know, it's the moment when fossil fuels come out of the ground for the first time. It's how we get here now. You know, that's when it all starts to shift. And, of course, it's when Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, that was such a prescient book about creating a new life form. Um, and I think to myself, all right, maybe this is going to be an evolutionary arc and we'll look back and we'll see that this is the moment when we started to literally evolve. Because as you know, in natural selection, evolution is very slow. But we have started to interfere with that. Mm. And we, that's why acceleration is the buzzword at the moment. Everything's moving faster. So it may be that we now need to deliberately interfere with our own evolution. If you take the Elon Musk route, um, who says, look, we must, we must merge with the technology we're creating so that it doesn't become an us-them situation, so that we, or we, we, we start to use things like digital implants, neural implants, um, uh, smart proteins which will run through the body, dealing with your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your heart rate. All of these things are within our grasp now, which will extend our lifespans and our health spans, perhaps only for the very rich, but will also start to create a different kind of homo sapiens, one which is not dependent, as we've always been, um, on our biological selves. You know, you know, Musk Neural Implants, he's got a company uh, called Neuralink, which is working on neural implants which will just go in your brain. And the idea is it will help paralyze people to com uh, communicate with their interface, their computer, even if they can't, they, just with their thoughts. So it's a wonderful idea. I mean, how great that humans, can, we can do this. But of course, it has implications for all of us, which is what Musk is really interested in, that the, imp the neural implant will mean you won't have to have a device. You will communicate seamlessly with the internet, with the web. Um, uh, Larry Page at Google talks about it as a magic. He says it'll be like a prayer. This is where it gets interesting. I want to talk to you about this in a minute. That you will just think the thought. Uh, you no need to look it up to Google it. And you'll get the answer because there's the implant. So you'll just say, Google, how do I get to Lauriston Place um, to see Stephanie and Jeanette? And into your brain, like a little whisper, will come the answer. But of course, it's a two-way door. That's the end of privacy. Because your thoughts can also be read at that point. So there's some ve that's the dystopian side of it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I honestly don't know which way it will go because you know we have such a, a history of screwing up every good idea we've ever had <laughs> that I imagine we'll screw up this one. But at the same time, I'm fascinated by this kind of moment where we, we, could, we could move beyond 
this place where we are now in every sense. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about the religious side of it, um, the historical side of it. You know, it's, it's almost as though we've always been saying this, isn't, haven't we? All religions say, I'm not tied to my body. Mm. This world is not my home. Um, how can it be that when I die, everything ends? I don't believe that. There must be a soul. There must be something that goes beyond this. And lo and behold, science is now saying, you know what? That's right. You're not going to be tied to this substrate made of meat. You are more. Um, suppose, suppose we've just been telling that story backwards, and now we're getting to the point we always knew, that this isn't all there is. But it's not about a sky god. It's because this is the moment we would get to eventually, where we could change ourselves. Homo sapiens four, I suppose. Well, and again, it, because you, you've got um, a couple of essays in the book that deal with the, the parallels between religious mm. belief and, and what's happening with this, um, the development of AI. And it is this idea that, that consciousness is not, doesn't have to be embodied in biological matter. Mm. And the idea that we could, at some point, download our brains, download the contents of our brains in order to persist beyond the lifespan of our, of our animal bodies. And uh, all of this is, again, it kind of reflects back to, you, you talk about the Gnostics and the and Buddhist tradition. And can you say a bit about how your own experience of um, religious, or your, you mentioned in the book that, that those people who have had a religious upbringing mm. will be able to kind of identify with this or see, perhaps see the parallels more clearly. Well, it, it felt very natural because of this business of thinking, you know, this is a temporary situation. Um, and whether or not you believe that, which I don't, uh, th that there is a fixed self that resides in what we call the soul or the spirit that then passes on, I don't think so. But the idea that which we, we, are not, we are far off it at the moment, perhaps even 50 years or so, but that you could scan the contents of a person's brain. Of course, at that moment, you could also edit those contents. This is where it gets really interesting. But we, and people, you know, people who say, oh, that will never happen, I, I think um, probably aren't thinking about how much has happened. It's only 50 years or so when we, we transplanted the first heart, wasn't it, 1967, Christian Barnard, and now it's, it's so commonplace. I mean, that's what I mean about acceleration. Mm. We, we are moving so quickly into what is possible that the idea that you could scan the contents of a human brain, which, yeah, no, it's massive in there, a massive, massive thing. Um, it's the most complex bit of kit in the known universe, our brains at the moment. So, but to think that we couldn't do it, I mean, it all, all it needs is computational power, um, and that's to do with memory and speed. You measure computational power according to memory and speed, and at the minute, we couldn't do it. But I, I doubt that that will continue to be the case. And once we can do it, well, you could, you could um, scan my brain, and then you could, it'd be like this genie in the bottle stories, I'd have to live in your laptop. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd be saying, Stephanie, let me out. Um, you might not, you might not on three. You see, no, I'd get you to finish my next book. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but you know those stories about the genies in all these, it's, it's the religious stories, the folklore stories. We've heard all these stories about something that is a spirit that is not embodied, that gets trapped somewhere and needs to be freed. How many stories of those do we know? And also the idea that we ourselves are trapped somewhere in this meat space where we live, which, and we hate it that it gets old, that it fails that we go, that our loved ones go. It makes, it's never made any sense at all. I mean, since humans could reflect, we have reflected on death uh, and what comes next. We, we can't stop ourselves, whether we're religious or we aren't. Um, and that is why, for me, these parallels became so fascinating, that science and religion have been so far apart always. Um, and now they are, but by very different methods, really say, talking about the same story, um, that this is not the end stop. And also the idea of colonising space, you know, which, of course, rich men's fantasies is to have a rocket. How I many have we got? We've gone up at the minute. We've got Branson, Musk, yeah. and we Jeff Bezos up there, I know, in the penis rocket. But, <laughs> oh, how could he build that? But never mind. 
the sense that we won't stay here. And yes, of course, that seems to me in many ways very negative because we just trashed the place and now we want to go. But it also seems to me inevitable that we will have to explore space. And it's quite hard to do that in, a, in, in our physical bodies, which are bound by gravity. It would not be hard to do it. Um, for instance, if we could put ourselves into hibernation, if we were not bound in this substrate, if, if your consciousness could go elsewhere. And so I think the idea of embodied or disembodied is quite easy for religious people to manage. After all, half the world every day prays to a sky god, and that god is not embodied. You know, according to the Christian religion, the god was for a while in the person of Christ, but that was only ever temporary. So religion's always been very comfortable with the idea of is it embodied, is it not embodied? Um, and so I imagine moving forward that we will be, and robotics, of course, are the embodied part of artificial intelligence, but you're all dealing with non-embodied operating systems every day. When you shout at Siri or Alexa, you know, when you go on to, you're calling somebody up, you don't even know if it's a human being or a chatbot. And very often it's a chatbot when you're trying to get your washing machine repaired. You know, we're dealing with all of that now. And there's an essay in there, isn't there, called My Bear Can Talk, which really says, look, if you've ever fallen in love with your teddy bear, you will be able to make a relationship with a non-human life form, because you did. So you'll do it again. Uh, and it'll talk to you. And part that, I kind of love that in a way. I think it will end loneliness for many people. I think it will, you know, it's a bit like the movie Her, but it will cause us to reflect on what, it, what we really need. Do we really need humanness or do we need interaction, whatever that means? Mm -hmm. Um, and people say to me, oh God, but you know, it won't be like talking to your partner, it won't be like talking to a friend. But most of our conversations are so meaningless, aren't they? And when you come home and you say, <laughs> how was your day? Fine. What's for dinner? I don't know, what would you like? Maybe we should go out. I mean, it wouldn't be so difficult for a system to do that for you, <laughs> would it? <laughs> well, so I, I want to come back to this idea about relationships yeah. between humans and and tech and because that's something that um, is uh, to me a really fascinating part of the book but I want to ask in terms of this um, the, this sort of religious or spiritual aspect of it if consciousness can be disembodied and what we think of as as uh, human consciousness could exist independently of our bodies what where does art fit into this because you say in the book that we will have to redefine our understanding of things like relationships, but also creativity and meaning. If, um, and, and I know that you know, a lot of creative artists find this very alarming and, and uh, are sort of um, outraged at the idea that a piece of software could write a poem or paint a picture or create a piece of music as well as a, a gifted human artist might. But, um, what happens to that, that spark of inspiration, that human creativity? Does that exist, or is that something that can equally well be reproduced by an artificial uh, machine intelligence? Well, it's interesting at the moment, because musicians, um, Brian Eno is one of them, so, some of them do like working with um, an AI music system, because they say it allows them a different kind of creative response. So it's a collaboration between the human and the AI. And, you know, there's a story in the book about uh, an American um, composer, David Cope, who designed a program to repeat bark chorales, and he went out for a sandwich at lunchtime and came back to another 5,000. Um, because it just simply, that's, you know, it's, uh, AI is a pa it's pattern recognition. So it will recognise the patterns, then reproduce them in all kinds of possible sequences, which is interesting. Um, the Buddhists would say, or if you were in, in the Shinto religion uh, in Japan, they would say, does it matter where the creativity comes from, whether it's the wind blowing through the pipes, whether it's the sound of the river, whether it's something that you create, whether it's the natural world or a creative world, does it matter as long as it's an experience, which is one way of looking at it. We have created it, I think, haven't we? Because, because we're not bound. We don't feel bound to our bodies and to the utilitarian, um, mechanistic view of the world, because art isn't any of that. We created this madness of painting, drawing, music, telling stories, which has no real, uh, at that point, economic or evolutionary value. I mean, why, you know, you think about people drawing on cave walls with bits of okra and charcoal, 
they wanted to do that. You think about people sitting around the fire telling stories. Before there was written language, they wanted to do that. And the fact that any child will do a little dance, put a painting on the fridge, start banging some pots and pans. Um, we do seem to have this urge to do things which are not about getting money and spending it or increasing our status. I mean, art can do all of those things. It can get you money, cost you money, it can increase your status. But at root, it seems to be an expression of something which has nothing to do with the getting and spending initially. It's something we like to do. And you know, and you think before electricity, um, before convenience, people would tramp to a freezing hall to hear a, you know, um, a chamber music orchestra or whatever, just because they wanted to do it, not because it had any obvious value. So I think we will always carry on in our human way. I believe we will. But I think we will see AI picking up on that. Um, crunching our stories, our music, our forms. At the minute, it looks, it looks like mimicry and reproduction. I don't believe it will stay that way. I think we will start to see AI systems developing some really weird things on their own. And they may, th those things may not speak to us. There's a system now, there's a piece in the Atlantic Monthly magazine. I've only just read it, I haven't digested it yet. Um, it's a new programme where you write a few lines, I don't know if you saw this, and then the AI will continue it for you. And this woman who'd lost her sister, this is what the essay is about, said she found it incredibly cathartic because although she's, she's a fluent person, she's a journalist for a living, she couldn't write about the death of her sister. She could only ever write one or two lines. And she said then the AI picking it up suddenly started to release things in her. Um, and I never thought of that, that that could be a possibility, that the thing itself... Uh, would then prompt you in a way then to refine your own creativity. So what I hope at best is that there will be a collaboration and we will find new ways of doing what we do so well, um, which is our art making, you know, which is why we're here today. You know, we believe in the life of the mind, don't we? The inner life, the spiritual life, the deeper life that isn't subject to, say, the Facebook algorithm that tries to tell you everything about yourself. And, you know, one of the things we discuss in the book is how, at the moment, for me, what is corrosive is that social media does not want you to have an inner life because you can't monetize it. Whatever's under the surface, you can't get it. They just want you to be a series of surfaces. So you go from one surface to the next surface to the next. You must not have depths. Um, and this is there. There's a big clash between what we understand from, from art, creativity, the inner life, and where the very cynical push to monetize you know, every breath we take, every move we make, which is what social media is. So I think that however we start shoring up the inner life, standing up for it, saying, no, this has value which cannot be priced, then we are keeping, actually, our humanness and we're teaching it to this new system that will also need to learn our values. And that's optimistic. Yeah, I mean, that does seem to be the key to it, doesn't it? And that's what you... Um, one of the questions that you pose in the final essay, which is that you, if we are eventually, if, if humans are eventually to become obsolete, what do we leave of ourselves? What, I know. what values can we instill in these systems that are perhaps one day going to take over? Um, and one of the things... So strange, isn't it? We might be gone. It, I mean, it's t I find it absolutely I know. terrifying. We've only been here 300,000 years, folks, so don't get excited. You know, that's a very little, short blip in time. And we, I, think, I do think we might have reached the end of our usefulness in this present iteration, because we're going backwards now, aren't we? We are so going back. This isn't working in the way we thought it would in the millennium. I mean, look what is happening out there in the world. So it may be that this nasty, brutish species uh, needs to get a reboot <laughs> and that this is our chance. Because the other thing AI is not interested in is the status symbols that we're interested in. It's not interested in land grab and Ferraris and yachts and billions in the bank. It doesn't go shopping. It doesn't do any of that stuff <laughs> that we do. That's not going to be where its interest comes from. And it may be that we, in that symbiotic exchange we learn, could just give up on this kind of lunatic materiality that has, has accelerated since the Industrial Revolution. And it learns uh, to have some of those um, non-price-sensitive values that are the best of us, I think the best of us, 
the best of us isn't how much money we can make or how much land we can grab or who we can control. That's not the best of us. The best of us is our compassion, um, our, our generosity, our ideas, our creativity, all of that's us. Well, one of the things that, um, that could potentially be an advantage of um, these developments in technology that you discuss in the book is, is the idea of a genderless future in the sense that um, the old-fashioned mm. stereotypical notions of what men and women should do and the roles that we should occupy um, clearly have already been redefined by technology over the last half century or so but, um, and by medical technology, but that could become increasingly the case. And I, so I wanted to ask you about... Um, because there's so much in the book about the role of women in technology, in this field of computing. Mm. From the very earliest days, mm. women in this field have been erased, they've been sidelined, they have more recently been quite aggressively pushed out of the field of technology and computing. And you, one of the questions you set yourself at the beginning is why aren't there more women working in computing and technology. Can you tell us a bit about what you uncovered in your research for the book and some of these extraordinary women whose names have been forgotten or, or missed out of the record because they didn't fit? Yeah, and I mean, we'll, come, we'll come back to the, the gender a bit specifically in a minute, but I was surprised. I didn't expect to discover what I discovered. I just thought, this is a bit weird. And I kept listening to people, well-intentioned white liberal males mainly, saying, oh, well, if women wanted to do this sort of thing, there are no barriers anymore, they would do it, wouldn't they? Um, and I thought, maybe. I thought, OK, so are we seeing a, a genuine gender difference? Is women really not interested in uh, either building the platforms or doing the programming? Do they really not want to get involved in all of this? Um, and then when I started to look, I found that that was very far from the truth. I mean, not, you know, in obvious ways, many of you will have seen the film Hidden Figures uh, with all the women who worked on the NASA project, the, the space project. But, you know, it goes right back, you know, the beginning of the book talks about, obviously, Mary Shelley, but also Ada Lovelace, who, did the, the, who invented the word programming, worked with Charles Babbage, who was trying to build a computer but couldn't, don't blame him, because um, it would have been coal-fired anyway and run powered by <laughs> steam, and there'd only be room for one, because it, went, it was like one of those huge <laughs> iron train sets that went through Babbage's chambers, you know, made, made out of steel and levers and bevels and iron bits. And it was nothing like a modern computer, but Ada really really understood that if, if he could build it, she could, as she said, program it. And this, this was using um, differential equations. She was an excellent mathematician. Her father was Lord Byron. And he'd said, when he, when he separated from her mother, he said, she must never do poetry. So in order to manage this, her mother thought, oh, God, I better let her do maths. And so Ada became one of the few women in England to have a maths tutor. And she was brilliant at maths. Uh, and so developed these differential equations, which would eventually lead to what we know now as programming. Um, so there was Ada, but then going on from there, it was astonishing to me how many women had worked as human computers, because that's what the word meant, because it was seen as clerical. Um, and so therefore it could be dismissed and downgraded. So these human computers women were doing clerical work. And then of course you get Bletchley Park. And in 10,000 people at Bletchley Park, 7,500 were women. And they were working on the decoding. They were working in Hot A with the Colossus set and the bomb. Uh, they knew, you know, these, these are massive bits of kit to handle. Because at that point, computers didn't use binary, they used decimal. Um, so it was all, it looked like a huge telephone exchange. You know, you've seen the pictures. Um, and the women had to figure out how to literally program these things to run them. Um, afterwards, a lot of those women went out into the world, worked with Alan Turing at what was the Victoria University, it's now the University of Manchester, were still involved, but again, it was called clerical. And then in the 60s, were just not given the work. And that's what I couldn't understand. And there's a great story in there about a woman called Dame Stephanie Shirley, some of you may know of her. Um, she was a kinder transport kid who came over in the war, um, very good at maths, went to work for the post office after, after the war, because that's where all, all the interesting technology was going on in Dolly's Hill. She couldn't get promoted, even though she had a maths degree. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let her be in charge of anything. So she set up her own company, freelance programmers, couldn't get any work until she started signing the letters Steve Shirley. 
And then she got so much, she employed 300 women who weren't promoted or couldn't get jobs. It had all been in Bletchley Park. She didn't tell anyone they were women. There's a fantastic picture in the book, isn't there? Yeah. Of a woman called Anne Moffat with her little kid sit, looking up at her, two-year-old. Anne Moffat's doing something at the kitchen table. What she's doing is programming the black box for Concord. And if you've got time, go look on TED Talk, look up, just look up Stephanie Shirley. Her TED Talk is both one of the funniest, moving, wonderful things. She's nearly 90 now, multimillionaire. This woman just said, you know, this is what we encountered. Um, and then you'd think, oh, well, things change later, which I did. Because um, I looked and I thought, well, why were 37% of computing science uh, undergraduates and graduates women right up until 1984, and they were. And then they all disappear. And it's the pivotal moment Apple launches its first desktop computer. And the whole advert is keyed to somebody called Brian. Even though Brian's teacher in the advert is a woman, because lots of women were teaching computing science. From there on in, the whole thing switches. And women actually find that they're getting pushed out rather than welcomed in. So it's... A, it's, it's Historically incorrect to say women were not involved, they were, and now they're not, and that's what we've got to change. Yeah, uh, well, and in some instances, in some areas, um, for example, gaming, you know, there's been some stories of women being really quite viciously bullied out of um, those yeah. tech arenas because they're not seen as belonging there by the, no. the men who are... It's a very male, it's a smelly, yeah. geeky environment. And I think, you know, I've got two godchildren, both of whom did maths and more maths at A-level. Um, but one of them said, you know what, I can do other things as well. I can do history and politics. So I'm going to do that because I don't want to work with these boys. And she made a really conscious decision. She could, her father's a computer programmer. She could easily have done it. She can code. She didn't want to do it. She didn't want to work with him. The other one, the little one, the wonkish one, is building, is doing, building neural networks at Oxford now. So she's gone that way. Um, but she's actually quite introverted and on the spectrum and, and doesn't care. She's in it. And she can manage. But it's such a male environment. And I just think it's off-putting. And that's something men and women alike have got to, got to manage. Um, it's not about brains. Women's brains um, are not weird in some way. That means they don't want to do this. You know, think of, think of a really obvious example, that in 1900 in the UK, only 5% of medical doctors were women, and now it's 55%. Nothing happened to women's brains in 100 years. <laughs> Um, and loads of women, of course, you'll have noticed, mo there are more women in biological science. Women are now doing doctoring and uh, working as vets. There are huge numbers of women now are, are doctors and vets. Um, so they're still doing the caring profession side of it because um, they don't want to sit there looking at the bloody screens. So it's how we start to manage this and to persuade young women in particular that these are environments that, where they will be stimulated and won't find that it's hostile. And so many women, you know, the women who leave tech, it's massive. Even the ones who go in, the dropout rate is huge because they hate the environment. So I was a bit surprised. I didn't think it was going to be as bad as I found out. But all the stories are in there, so you can have a read. So we do have... And of course women have got to be in this conversation because if this is... Um, so the, size, the size of this conversation is epoch-changing, it's species-changing. We can't just leave it to um, a load of guys to do. We just can't. Well, and you do make the case in the book, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, that um, at the moment, AI is something that has to receive input. Yes. And so what is happening is that it is getting, but it's re repeating the biases of mm. the people who are doing the programming. So mm. you make the argument that we need uh, not only more, obviously, more women and more people of colour at the table, but also um, artists, uh, philosophers, you know, creative people. We need everybody to be part of this conversation about where this, these developments are going to take us next. Yeah, we do. And we also need people who can write the kind of English that other people can read. <laughs> and, and trust me, I go to these conferences, and by the afternoon, my brain is, is, is just aching through the act of translating what should be a language called English into what actually is a language called English. <laughs> um, but, you know, because there's this kind of Mandarin obfuscation uh, that people like to do to shut other people out. 
and that happens a lot in tech. So they use like, you know, there are some examples in there you, in, from people who should know better. And you just read it and you think, what the fuck are you on about? Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not a stupid woman. I can manage, I can manage language. And I look at it and it's not because I don't know, I don't know what they taught, the principles, of course I do. But it, the way that it's done is really designed to shut out your intelligent, curious reader. And that, you know, really they need us guys in there looking at it because we could really make that. So that's what I wanted the book to be. I wanted you to read it and get excited. I wanted it to be accessible without dumbing down. Um, and that was part of my mission, really. Not to sound like, you know, bless them, the Ada Lovelace Institute or the Alan Turing Institute. Fabulous, but you should just go online and read some of their stuff. Um, let's come back to... Um the idea about gender, because one of the essays yeah. I found the most fascinating in the book is called Fuck the Binary. And it is about this idea that we have, humans have, we have this sort of, we gravitate towards the idea of labeling things and mm. categorizing, and we like opposites and mm. we like the idea of binaries. And actually what this new technology is going to allow us to do is to uh, have, make those boundaries more porous, to have mm. a much more fluid sense of ourselves and you know you use the word transhuman quite a lot and you know we hear a lot of, at the moment about transgender and so this idea that that our identities are not fixed and in the future we will have a much more fluid sense of of ourselves um mm. that's something that you've explored in fiction as well i mean particularly in your most recent novel in frankenstein but um can you tell us a bit about how you see that and how how you see that technology playing out in people's lives. Yes, gender is a strange thing, isn't it? Um, because it's just not the same as biological sex differences, which obviously exist. Gender differences, I'm sure, are constructed, aren't they? Because they change over time. Um, you know, the illustration of suddenly you can't be a doctor in 1900 because your brain won't take it and suddenly in 2020 it's fine. Um, so, that, you know, gender is it's, it's, it's by no means a measure um, of what either sex is capable of or is in any terms at all, you know. But there's still the overriding umbrella of patriarchy, which is still biased in terms of straight white males, and we know this, we know, we know it from the data sets. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy, but it's still there. And I hope that we won't gender this technology because AI does not have a gender. You know, it's not born, it's not born male or female, it just is. And if we genderize it, it will both tell us, you know, that how committed we are to gender roles and genderizing, and it does appear to be that we are. Um, and also, perhaps, but challenge all of that because it doesn't need to be the case. Does it? And part of you know the upheavals that we're going through at the moment, in every sense, so many upheavals. I think our upheavals around identity, gender identity, who are we? And you know, and you see the awfulness of what's happening in Afghanistan with um, backward militarism, um, Islamism, with the Taliban, and wanting to sort of rigidly enforce gender roles, which somehow they believe um, are, are real metrics of, of, of worth and outcome in, in, instead of invented things. Um, we see that happening again, and it, it seems fairly credible, doesn't it, in the 21st century, that we should still be seeing that happening in our world. So fix, no, you can't play soccer, you can't even ride your bike. You know, you've seen those scenes this week with them, women being told they can't go out except shopping. You know, they're back in the handmaid's tale um, for no better reason than they haven't got a dick. You know, it's not a magic wand. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sure that everyone in here who's got one, I'm sure it's lovely, but it's, you know, <laughs> there's nothing about it that's special. It just is, it just is. And that's all, and, that, and how it's become this, this totem of possibility um, is that when you look at it objectively, it's just so very, very odd. And we do have to get away from that. It's nothing to do with brains and it's nothing to do with genitalia. It's to, it's to do with societal roles. And so that one of the things I hope is that we will have this sort of uplifting, freeing possibility, not only in our bodies. And you know, I think about transhumanism as the new mixed race, because if we do merge with technology, um, that will make us very different creatures, won't it? Uh, therefore, with very, with very different outcomes. 
Um, so that's the optimistic part of me. And the pessimistic part thinks, no, we're so committed to endlessly dividing, subdividing, and labeling people um, so that we can control and contain them. I don't know if, if our mindset's ready for what we've invented. It usually isn't. And you know that's what happened in the first industrial revolution, isn't it? Where you think, we, a machine that can do the work of six men, how wonderful. Um, you won't have to work 12-hour days now. We can all share the profits. But did we know? All we did was drive down wages, invent a factory system, which was so horrible for at least 100 years for the people who worked in it before benefits began to trickle down. So we're very good at inventing things which should labor save, which should end scarcity, which should permit abundance, which should mean that we can share the spoils. And instead, we turn them into the most fearful dystopia, where only a few get to live well. And you know, we've, we've put a push through that. But will we, are we going to create it all again now in a different way, in a much more frightening way? Because the rich are in charge of this technology big time. And if that doesn't change, then yes, you will, you will see not just a dystopia, but I think a, a highly gendered dystopia, which privileges white men. Well, and we've seen, um, I mean, it just in, in a very concrete example, um, which you do talk about in the book, and which again appeared in your, in your last novel, the idea of sex robots mm. replacing women and there are those who make the argument that this is actually a good thing because it, it stops um, men taking out violent urges on real women and those who are against it so it's actually sort of normalizing the idea of um, that you can own a body which you then can do whatever you like to and it is uh, there to whenever you push a button we'll just do mm. whatever you want and w that's something that you come down on the side of being quite against I got them. Yeah, I am. Um, and not, not for reasons of sex use at all. Um, the more I looked into it, if you go online, you can look up uh, Harmony. She's, she's the most advanced sex bot uh, made by Matt McMullen at Real Botics. And you can have a look at Harmony. And she blinks, you know, she looks like a porn star, of course. Um, and they, they've all got elongated legs and big boobs and uh, they never age. But Harmony will talk to you and she can be programmed to talk about your interests and she learns as you do because she's AI enhanced. So this isn't just, you know, we're far away from blow up dolls now or even bits of silicon. Um, they, you know, there are three holes which vibrate and fully operational and there's more useful than in a, in a, um, a bio woman. You can just detach the vagina and wash it. In, and you didn't used to be able to do that. You used to have to drag the entire doll into the shower and sort of turn her upside down, which usually meant getting spray up your nose and God knows what else. But so things have improved. Um, and you know, if you really don't have any money, you can just buy the detachable cunt. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can. It's the bottom line, I suppose. And you just buy that the bit that you anyway. But if you want the full bot experience that will talk to you, you can have it. Now, the problem really is not the bot. It's that this is, this is a new technology, but it, it's absolutely predicated on some, some Stone Age values about gender, power, and money, because men are buying the woman. She does what she's meant to do. She sits at home. She can't go out, obviously. Um, she's always there for you. Um, she can't say no. There's no you, can, you can have one that says no, but only in a teasing way. Um, <laughs> So it entirely reinforces the worst kind of stereotypes. And yes, some people say, some feminists say, this is fine because, you know, let all those nerds have their sex doll. But I don't, how does that then work when you have to go in the real world and you, your boss is a woman or you're dealing with somebody who's female? Uh, you know, you can buy executive outfits. They're very popular. They have a big rip up the skirt so she, you can fuck her up the arse. So, you know, women must not get too uppity if they're boss. So there are problems with sex dolls, definitely. Sex workers don't like them for obvious reasons. But you can get sex doll brothels because you can't have a brothel if it's not a person. So they, 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 they count as uh, uh, gaming dens. So they get around all the laws. So you've got them in Ireland, in Spain, in France, and they can't be raided because they're not brothels, because there's no humans in them. But you know, the saddest story I recently read, there's a big AI brothel outside the Foxconn factory in China where they make your iPhones. Um, and as you know, Foxconn has the nets to stop people jumping off the roof and killing themselves because the conditions are so bad. And there was an AI brothel there, and men were actually starting to fight over the dolls because they thought they were making relationships with these dolls. They didn't have time for relationships with humans, 
um, 12 hour days. So they go there and spend their money on a doll and then some other guy go with the doll and they go and beat the guy up outside. So the AI function has been disabled so that men won't form attachments. Isn't it time we got an upgrade? Ordinary. Yeah. Isn't it time? <laughs> so that's well, the sex doll. It's an interesting yeah. essay, hot for a bot. On, Just jump in and read that one. On, on that note, um, <laughs> detachable vibration vaginas. Um, women, by the way, do not buy male ones because apart from the bit you know, that we are interested in, that's why women buy dildos or vibrators because you can keep that in your drawer. And you don't have to... What were you going to do with 35 kilos of men? You put them in the wardrobe or something. <laughs> mm. Especially if you live in a... And women drive smaller cars. You know, you've got to jam them into your Renault Twingo. Um, we don't do it. Uh, well, now... Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I'm have, sorry. I've gone prompted, too far. I've, I've gone too I'm far. Sure. If you're out there online, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I hope that has prompted some questions, if, if, not, if the rest of it hasn't. Um, <laughs> we're going to take some questions now. We, uh, we've got a roving mic going to our real-life uh, biological meat audience here. <laughs> and um, we've got some questions coming in uh, on this device, which is where you see my ineptitude with all things technical. Um, so what I'd like to do in order to juggle these, if somebody would like to put their hand up uh, for a question in the audience. We'll get a microphone to you while I... Yes, there's a gentleman up there in a green shirt, and while you get the microphone, I will ask this question from Stephen, okay. who says, do you read much science fiction? And if so, do you have any recommendations? <laughs> Should we even call it science fiction? No, I don't think... It's all, it's all converging, isn't it? I mean, one of the things that does interest me is that sci-fi... There's an essay in the book uh, from... from um, sci-fi to Wi-Fi uh, to MiFi or my wi I can't remember the title of it, but it's so much of it that has been uh, envisioned by science fiction has come to pass, uh, and that is very interesting. Uh, and one of the things that, that I did do when I was researching this book was I went back and read a lot of pulp fiction in, from the American 50s and 60s, uh, Stuff, you know, that every, it was just going in the comics, really. Um, because that was actually where the cutting edge was. It wasn't just Ray Bradbury. There was a whole load of writers who were just pumping stuff out every week into sci-fi magazines. And, and so much in there um, seemed prescient of where we are and what we do now. So what I kind of like to do is go, when I'm trying to think about a topic, I always start by going backwards. I think you do too with your books as well, don't you? Try and get back as far as I can. Yeah. and then build forward from there. Because in the going backwards, we find that so many elements um, are present. You know, as we talked about at the beginning, it's not just the myths, the legends, you know, like the shape-shifting legend. Today I can be uh, a bison, tomorrow I can be an eagle, uh, then I'll be you, then you'll be me. Yeah. All of that is so present, you know, that, uh, and also that sci-fi, it is a sci-fi trope which became one that, you know, you're not stuck in this body. We, every shamanistic experience is about leaving the body. You know, so many sci-fi stories are about finding that your body is changing, either voluntarily or otherwise. Um, you know, what, what else is Jekyll and Hyde about? It's that kind of yeah. thing that we will imbibe, ingest something. It could be a contaminant or, you know, it could be, it could be some sort of new potion. And it will change us. You know, it's little love stories, Tristan and Isol, what else is that? It's about a complete reset of mind and or body so that we become other than we are. The core self is altered. Um, and that's a real trope, I think, Stephen, of, of, of sci-fi. And we're seeing it. It's not just about putting the space suit on. It's about the alteration of what we fondly call the core self, whether it's something that just blows your mind or actually blows your body as well. And you know, for me, all the row about trans stuff at the moment is I think you know, it's the canaries in the coal mine. This is the beginning of the transformation of the human self, of the human form, um, into alternatives, into choices. Um, I do believe that little kids being born now will not only be able to choose their body, but choose it more than once in a lifetime. It's going to change. It's going to be completely extraordinary. That's the optimistic bit. Go on. <laughs> um, okay. Dr. up here. Hi. Yeah, I was just wondering, where does humour fit into this future world of artificial, artificial intelligence? The question was prompted by a couple of things you said when you talked about some of us having a magic wand, and that got a laugh. A couple of sentences later, you said we must get a grip, and that didn't, but it was, it was equally funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, on the magic wand, I guess. Um, 
There has to be humour. I mean, when you look at the world situation, it's, you know, it's, it, it demands both, doesn't it? It demands our absolute seriousness and best intent and intensity, our total concentration, which isn't easy, is it, in the, in the social media world and, me, me, and the weapons of mass distraction. It's very hard for anybody to concentrate. Um, so we need that. We need that absolute focus and seriousness. I do believe so. And lack of cynicism. But we also need to laugh at ourselves because we are ridiculous. And th that does matter. And there are a lot of jokes in this book, uh, and not just in the sex bot stories. But it is that sense of simultaneously taking yourself seriously and not taking yourself seriously at all, isn't it? Uh, and because otherwise, if you, don't, if you can't laugh at yourself, you can't realize your mistakes, you're always just so worried about your self image and, and how you appear that you, if you have to be able to make fun of yourself, it's very important. Uh, and I think, will robots develop a sense of humour? Probably. I mean, we, I think, will be their joke. I mean, can you imagine a super intelligence looking at us? I mean, <laughs> it'll be a laugh a minute, won't it? I mean, there's an essay in there called Jurassic Car Park, um, which suggests that if we don't get this right, they'll just shunt us off to a shopping mall with some uh, outdated automobiles, and we'll still think that we're world king, and everything we do will be completely irrelevant. Um, yes, another audience question. There's a lady up there, and if you want to, oh, do you, yeah, you go first, and then we'll come back to. Thank you. Um, my question is about your inner life and how you guard it, and your relationship with social media and technology. Yeah. Well, look, I'm, I'm fortunate because I'm an, I'm an analog human in a digital world. I, I was born before any of this happened, which gives me a huge advantage in that I can use it without feeling it's necessary or feeling swamped by it. Look, I don't want to give up Google. Of course I don't. Or, or my, my smartphone. No, no. But I don't have a Facebook account, and I never will. Um, I think Facebook is the evil empire, actually. And I, don't, I know that my data's gone everywhere because I've done a data check. I know that I can't recall any of that. Um, but at the same time, it's not, I think it's not where we, we should live, I don't think. It's what I said earlier about living on surfaces. There is a surface, but we mustn't just keep living on surfaces. And it's up to us all to find what is our own meaning of life and to decide what are our own values, our core values. You know, for instance, Donald Trump has no values. I don't know that Boris has any, I doubt it. But things that don't endlessly flip-flop and change, what are, each of you has to decide what are your values um, and what will you stand by? Uh, not just the hill that you die on, but you know, roughly speaking, what could you say um, about what you believe? And hold to that. You know, of course, you've got to be able to change and change your mind and see that we were wrong. We know we talked about that. We have to update ourselves. There have to be new versions of self, yes. Um, but there also has to be things that we do really believe in. And that, I think, allows us to create meaning and to um, ward off with a kind of titanium shield all of that out there, which is not about your well being, it's about monetizing you. Um, and that's what you have to avoid. We always ask, you know, is, is somebody making money out of this, uh, out of me in this way? And try to avoid those things, I think. But I do have a Twitter account, yes. Um, and I'm not giving that up anytime soon. You've got one. Yeah. Yeah. Are you on Facebook? Um, not so, just for friends and family, but yeah, I, yeah I, I'm... I go through phases of trying to give up Facebook because, but now everything's owned by Facebook. So everything's if you're owned going by Facebook. That, you might as I know, well give they, up all kind of uh, I know. means of communication. So it's, it's difficult, difficult, isn't it? It is ethically. I mean, I do feel you know after the the there was an article I read a headline this morning saying um, that the most viewed uh, article on Facebook in the the early part of this year in the U.S. was about how the vaccine will kill you. And, and that hasn't been, it wasn't removed, it wasn't moderated, no. and it's, you know, it's very, very difficult to combat that, that level of... Um, yeah, I mean, the levels of bullshit going around now are truly terrifying, aren't they? I mean, in the, the alternative fact department. Do we have another question from the audience? Here? Oh, I'm reading, listen to music, and go for walks, and do your own thing. You know, just do your own thing. Switch it off, leave your phone at home, go for a walk. Yeah. Yeah, a lady down, down here in the red, um, and then we'll come back. We've got, we'll have to keep this one quick because time is running out, but 
I just wondered, um, you mentioned before that it's the rich white men that have all the control at the moment. How will that change, do you think? Well, I'm, I'm putting my money on the young generation. Um, the politicised ones, not the ones who've been entirely swallowed up by the social media machine. Um, I, you know, thinking about, I don't know about you, your son's, what, 19? Yeah, 19. Yeah. They, I think the, the, the switched on ones are getting it, aren't they? And they, I think there, there is going to be a pushback, a fight back, a different way of reading, seeing society. I don't think my generation and the one just below are going to be in charge forever. Like, this is what I hope. You know, because I see among young people um, such a sense of social justice, you know, and, and a sense of wanting things differently and criticising my generation. Mine is the Thatcher generation who did so much damage with the neoliberal project. Proper critiques of us, which we deserve. And th that's where, you know, I want to help. I want to be part of the solution, of course. But I think it's those young people coming up and coming through now who will be able to start changing the agenda, you know, and, and in some senses that, you know, the fact that you can organize a demonstration so quickly just on your phone, that is a great thing. Mm. You know, this isn't all bad. We can get people to the place needed. Um, I do believe that, but I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that the negativity is not so ubiquitous that young people cannot break through it. I think they can. Do you think so? Yeah, I do hope so. Yeah. And actually, that's the question I was going to ask that, that are coming from Addy, I wanted to end on, which is, is there hope for humankind? But I think you've answered it by saying that it is, if there is hope for us, it will lie with the next generation who won't yeah. accept those kind of injustices. And they're not so binary. They're not so bound. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the thinking ones aren't. And... I think they will be able to embrace what's good about tech and many things about tech are good and perhaps push aside the things which yeah. would just swamp us. I'm afraid that is going to have to be the last question. Um, I just want to say before we thank Jeanette that uh, if you are watching at home online, you can go to our independent festival bookshop and order a copy of 12 Bytes or any of the other books from festival authors this week. Um, if you are here in person, Jeanette is going to be doing a signing in the festival bookshop. Uh, are you, I hope you're signing too. And uh, Well, I can if people want me to. Do, because, <laughs> you know, this is, listen, I want to thank Stephanie because this kind of thing is such a labour of love, trust me, because I do it as well. Um, and it's, it's so great to have somebody you can talk to intelligently on stage. Thank oh, well, you. thank you. And thank you, Jeanette.